So first off, I saw Black Bear last month or two at Cinefest Sudbury and was sort of like blown away by it. Um, and it's also strange because it's a movie that I feel it's really hard to talk about while also I want to tell everyone to see it. And then everyone always asks me what it's about. And I'm like, uh, just watch it, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, something... I've always been like, I've always loved uh, Aubrey Plaza and Christopher Abbott. And I know you sort of mentioned how you wrote with Aubrey in mind, but how did Christopher and then also Sarah Gaydon also get involved? Um, well, I had seen, um, I saw Sarah in, in James Seamus's movie Indignation uh, a few years before I wrote Black Bear. And I had never seen her in anything before. And I kind of just had one of those crazy reactions where I was like, this is one of the best performances I've ever seen in my life. Like I totally have to work with this person. Um, so, um, so I always wanted to work with her and the same is true of Chris. I, I can't, I can't, uh, oh yeah, it was James White. That's what it was. So I had seen Chris and James White, um, which is a great movie and, and he's just incredible in it. But also knowing the other films that he'd been in, I knew that he had a lot of versatility because, uh, you know, I had seen him in, um, in other things where he played very different characters from the one he depicts in James White. Mm -hmm. So I'd seen them in those two films and always wanted to work with them. And luckily, as it turned out, um, when I offered the movie to Aubrey and she wanted to do it, um, it turned out that her, her agent is the same, uh, also represents Sarah. So, um, so, and he was a big ally, his name, guy named Chris Andrews. And he, uh, he showed the, the movie to the, the script to Sarah and she wanted to do it. So that was awesome. And then um, Chris was at the same agency. So uh, we, we, we kind of went through the CAA channels to get to him as well. I'd offered Chris a, a part in another movie I was trying to get off the ground and he said no, but I was not dissuaded. And I, I, I tried a second time and, and this time it worked out. I think it's funny that you bring bring up James White because I remember I saw that film as well and blew me away. And I think that was one of the films that first put him on my radar. Yeah. But I talked to a lot of people about it and they're like, I've never heard of it. But yeah. filmmakers everywhere always are like, oh, that's where I saw him first. Like, yeah, such a great sort of like filmmakers film as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was curious because there's a lot of big intense monologues was there a lot of rehearsal or was it just like on no the there was no really no rehearsal at all we didn't do any scene work um and any blocking rehearsal that we did was on the day so um really the only preparation that i did with the actors was was some script meetings from afar um actually chris luckily chris and i were both in new york at the time so i met with chris uh, two or three times uh, before we got to set to to talk through the script, um, which was a lot of fun, and he really got it. And then um, I, I similarly talked to Sarah via phone uh, before the shoot, and um, and uh, Aubrey as well. So uh, so I had just had some preliminary conversations where we went through the script and discussed any confusions that they might have had, um, and changed any lines that they didn't feel would come natural naturally to them um and other than that there was really no preparation at all um i was going to ask because it it definitely can tell i remember the first time watching it before i had any other knowledge of the film was that especially in the first act it's so clear that it's sort of like meant for aubrey like she mm -hmm. flows so effortlessly in it mm -hmm. um there's a moment that she does in the first act where she's like playing with dominoes and setting them up mm -hmm. how intentional was that because i feel like that's sort of definitely about like the gross manipulation in the second act where it's sort of it's, it's just setting it all up and then waiting for it to happen mm -hmm. yeah that was not in the script those were just dominoes that happened to be on set and uh she she saw the prop and used it those those could have easily not been used so that's just one of those um, happy, happy things that you discover while you're on set. When she did it, I, I realized why it was resonant and why it was resonant. So, um, you know, I was cool with it. Uh, 
And I thought it, I thought it made sense. I think it was just one of those, those things that you discover on set. Same is true for um, what, you know, in part two, when the, the boom operator asks for silence on set after Aubrey's just had her breakdown. Um, so we have to sit in this awkward silence. That was something that Aubrey suggested on the day as well. So she's really creative and brought a lot of great ideas to the movie. Um, speaking of the set, I'm more of a Joe comment, but I'm hoping that the energy and experience on that set was a lot more lighter than the one that you had portrayed in it. How was, how was it like trying to film something within a movie as well? Well, I wouldn't say that energy was light, but I don't, I also wouldn't say it was like a uh, forum for sadistic torture either, which the movie is. Um, no, it was a very difficult shoot. We, uh, we only had 20 days to make the movie and we were shooting all overnights. So, um, and we could, there was no overtime either because eight hours, night is eight hours long. When the sun comes up, you're done shooting. So, uh, and, and when it goes down, you've got to start if you need night, if you need real night. So um, it was 28 hour days, which is not a lot of time to make a movie. Um, so uh, it was very stressful for me and, uh, and I'm sure for the cast who had to do these difficult uh, scenes. Um, so it was a very hard working set. You know, it was a very dedicated focus set. Um, so I wouldn't say no, the energy wasn't light. Uh, there were some moments of levity, and I think probably, um, but but everybody had to work really hard, and and uh, so so it wasn't easy. Um, have you been reading some of the reviews or like statements or reactions about people sort of saying how they love the film, but they don't really know if they get it? Mm -hmm. Because that's uh, something I like. I felt after seeing twice, where I'm like, I you, I keep trying to dive into it and try and figure it out, and there's so many layers and aspects yeah um you know it's interesting i i don't read my reviews but I, i'm aware of that reaction just from talking to friends that have seen it or you know whatever like people actual people that i'm talking to not the critics aren't people but you know conversations right. i don't read my reviews and um you know it's interesting some people find it exciting and, and and some people are alienated by it i'm one of the people who's excited by ambiguity and i think it's more true to life um you know life doesn't boil itself down into simple meanings um life is confusing and tough to pin down and just when you think you've got a handle on the truth something happens that undermines it so I wanted the movie to reflect that, that reality. Um, and uh, some people, you know, they're used to movies spoon feeding them comforting truths and certainty, but, uh, but I didn't want to do that this time. I just, I think it's more interesting and truthful to, to go a different direction. Were some of the characters sort of meant to represent parts of yourself or other people you may have worked with on set or stories from friends of friends? Um, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, to, to, to say they were meant to be anything in particular, uh, is, is kind of difficult to, difficult to, to parse. Um, the movie was written very intuitively, uh, and it came out of me from a mood that I was in, you know, just like, it kind of came out of my feelings, uh, my, my, my pain or whatever I was going through at the time. So um, the writing process was pretty subliminal. Uh, that being said, um, you know, I've been on movie sets now for almost 20 years and I've seen all sorts of shit and, you know, a lot of it made it into the movie. Also, you know, I've read a lot about film sets and I love backstage dirt. You know, I, I love reading about Jean-Luc Godard's film sets or Stanley Kubrick's film sets or Alfred Hitchcock's film, film sets. So. Um, you know, there's some of that as well. So combination of, you know, Hollywood lore, real life uh, experiences and imagination. Um, speaking of Kubrick, that something that always stuck out to me was like, was Gabe sort of maybe an indictment of like filmmakers like Kubrick or Cassavetes who are like famously known for belittling and attacking female actors Add into a great performance but then still walk away revered from it instead of being known as like 
these potential horrible toxic people. Yeah, I think so. You know, I'm certainly not condoning that behavior. Yeah, it, it's clear, especially there's a there's like the shot afterwards when everything is done where you just see all the cast just or the crew just sort of in silence like stunned at what they just saw and you're like oh how are we again like you you can look up to Kubrick who someone I admire but at the same time like the things he's done can't you can't look at that and be like oh that's a good person there has there has to be a fine line between that Mm -hmm. yeah um I want to ask about like the bear. Did it represent to me it just sort of represented like this eventual impending doom? Was it something else mm-hmm. in your mind? I think that's a good way to read it. Um at the time I was looking for an ending and uh you know I wanted I thought oh a, a car crash would be be a good way to to kind of to for, to resolve this. And I was looking for something that would be in in that environment. Uh, that would cause them to swerve off the road. And bear was the most interesting choice. You know, um, I think it could have been a coyote or it could have been w- w- any other beast of, of the forest. But um, bear was the one that seemed and felt right to me. But I didn't really know why. Um, and then after I'd written the script, I sort of wondered why that, that came to me. And it occurred to me that bears are a symbol of death and rebirth, you know, because they hibernate every year. Uh, So in a sense, that's to me what this film is about. Um, It's about how we suffer things um, that we feel have killed us or some part of us. And then uh, we find a way to be reborn. And in the case of the the lead of this movie, Allison, um, she's channeling her pain into, uh, into her art. Do you find it? Uh, also to jump from that uh so how long until you had an actual title for the film because if it seems was it not connected at first uh the title no the title for the film was actually uh came I, I didn't know what to call it uh I, I had no idea what to call it i think it was called i had some working title um that was like you know allison by the lake or something <laughs> Uh, But when I came up with the bear, um, you know, I think it was a suggestion from Aubrey that I think she said, well, what if we called it the bear or bear? And I thought, well, that's okay, but it's missing something. (laughs) And then I put black before it because it seemed to convey a certain darkness and a certain, like you were saying, uh, there was a certain death, deathly quality uh, to, to, you know, to blackness and, and uncertainty, you know, and confusion. So uh, I added the black and that's how we got the title. Um, do you find that it's, I, I think I do, but like if it's a, a film sort of hard to talk about, because for me it was when I try and tell, even I told my partner about it and I was like, try not to watch the trailer because mm-hmm. I sort of wanted them to go as blindly as yeah. I did. Is, do you find it sort of also hard to, promote and talk about sometimes yeah i do i mean it's it's kind of agony i mean i kind of gave up it's just sort of agony to market a movie like this without without giving away um certain things that are supposed to be very surprising within it um the whole point of the movie is to is for the audience to never know where it's going and now that a trailer exists i think the audience will encounter it in a slightly different way but I guess the other option was they're not going to encounter it at all because we can't cut a trailer, you know? Yeah. So uh, it's just one of those like devil's bargains that, that life is, uh, has a way of, of, of forcing us into. I, th- I think um, it's strange because I've I seen the film prior to seeing the trailer. And then when I watched the trailer, I was like, oh, why? they're showing the film yeah. making part. But then... Um, I posted about it being to to inform people to be like, hey, go watch this movie, but avoid the trailer, but just keep an eye out for the name at the very least. Mm -hmm. And a few people did end up watching the trailer. And one of them was my partner who watched the film with me. And she had said like, oh, I didn't get any of the stuff. So it didn't spoil anything. But I think because I was aware of what happens and you so ingrained in understanding the film watch a trailer and you're just like oh it's spoiling everything like i because that's right, what i felt right. as well 
Yeah, and so when, when the trailer first, when when the uh, when the distributor first sent me the trailer, I was concerned about this, and I sent it to a bunch of friends of mine who who hadn't seen the film yet, and they told when I asked them what I, they thought had ha happened in the movie, none of them knew. So I felt like, eh, okay, this is fine. It, you know, it, it, I'd prefer to not even know that you're going to have a filmmaking element in this movie. You know, but uh, but it didn't seem like it, it it would ruin it for them. So, was that one of the aspects when you went into the second act to sort of decide to go? Because the first act is all sort of like static and tripod or or, mm -hmm. or dolly, but the second is a lot. There's a lot more handheld. Was that part of the early decision, or was it more on set when they came up with it? Yeah, um, I think the, the, since we were trying to play with notions of what's real and what's fiction, um, it was important for us to establish a really realistic tone and within that tone have surrealistic things happen. So um, in, order to, in order to keep people in, I wanted people to think they were watching something that felt very real in part one. And then when they saw something after, when part one unfolds, you know, and something happens next, I was worried that the audience was going to think, okay, well, nothing is real now. So I was aware that I needed to make the second part even more real than the first. And my solution to the problem was in the first part, I would have very, very naturalistic performances, but I wouldn't use any handheld. So I would shoot it simply and keep the performances as naturalistic as possible. And then when part two happened, for a time at least, I wanted the audience to think they were watching a documentary mm -hmm. um, or it could be a verite documentary. So the second part is all handheld. Um, so anyway, that was, that was, that's the only aesthetic difference between the two. The lighting is very similar. The color palette's very similar. The music draws elements from part one themes from part one and builds on them and adds layers of complexity to them in the same way that part two does uh, for the for the visual and dramatic concerns. Um, well, it's not often that I feel that I watch a movie that like causes so much stress and I try and then go and praise it and tell all my friends to watch it. But that's <laughs> something I have been doing. Um, Thank you. Because I think I, I, I relate it to when you're hanging out with a friend who's just like in a relationship and while you're hanging out they sort of get into a fight and you're stuck in the middle of it and you're just mm -hmm. waiting it out and mm -hmm. that's what it feels for like an hour and 45 minutes <laughs> yeah. but at the same time it, there's so much like the writing and everything is impeccable and the conversations that everyone is having with one another is you can't look away so it's also a car crash at the same time so it's there's so many things happening in it yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, well, I loved it and uh, look forward to everyone else also talking about it as the year ends and such. Yeah, thanks a lot, Andres. I appreciate it. Man. You as well. Take care.